The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that as we study your word, that by your spirit you'll give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and grace in our hearts to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, it is a, uh, a joy and a privilege to be here again. I uh, was here 16 weeks ago and uh, confirmed quite a number of folks and licensed some lay catechists, and it's great to see that they're still intact, you know, after all that warfare the last 16 weeks or whatever it is. Uh, and it's, uh, it, is, it is a great day. It's a wonderful occasion. Morning prayer today. We had confirmation. Congratulations again, Nathan. The Lord bless you. And uh, we had a great day yesterday. Uh, with some training for uh, new ordinance who will be ordained coming up soon in our uh, missionary gatherings. And so uh, I'm feeling pretty good about how things are going right now. Uh, now, who knows what Monday will bring, but uh, we'll, we'll rejoice and celebrate while we, while we have it. So I'm, I bring you greetings. This is really a great day. It's, it's a wonderful mem- memorial, a, a day that we'll remember, I'm sure, for a long, long time. And so greetings on behalf of uh, all the Anglican Diocese of the Great Lakes. Um, You know, someone has asked me about the schedule and travel, and there is a lot of it over multiple states. Um, But it is a joy because it it reminds us what it looks like to be members of one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And I've said this everywhere I go. I'll probably keep saying it until people say, Bishop, please stop saying that. But uh, I, I just love how we understand what it means to be members of that one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The, the denomination I grew up in, there, were, there was a connection of congregations across multiple states, but basically every congregation was an entity all unto itself. And so when you talked about your home church, there was only one of those, and it was in your town in a particular neighborhood where you went on a regular basis And that meant any place else you went, you were a visitor. I love the understanding that we are one church. So I I tell everybody everywhere I go, it doesn't matter if I'm in Indiana or Michigan or Kentucky or Ohio, I always say I'm, I'm so happy to be in my home church today because that's the reality of how Christ has made us one. And so when I bring you greetings, I I truly bring you greetings from 42 active congregations across multiple states because we are one in Christ. And we get to celebrate today what uh, the folks of St. Anselm, First Lakewood Anglican Mission, uh, and now St. Anselm Anglican Church, for what you folks have done, for what you have given and sacrificed and prayed for and labored for for years to come to this day. And uh, not for you only, but it's great to see uh, Father Gene here today and Christ Church West Shore that was uh, at the very beginning and helping this all to begin, as well as uh, Archdeacon Jeff Smead is here for our Eastern Missionary. I see other clergy from across the, the diocese in the area here. And we join with you in just celebrating what you have labored for. It was said earlier at at our lunchtime gathering in a plaque that was given to Father Sean uh, from Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And above everything else, we're here to celebrate what Christ himself has done. He, Jesus, the Lord of the church, the head of the church, is the one who builds his church. And we're here to celebrate that. And he uses lots of folks to join in, to, to labor in the harvest field with him. And so we celebrate that today. I want, to, uh, I want to point out a couple of key aspects of what I saw in the readings today. These readings are, are not the regular lectionary readings. They're the, the specific readings for the day of dedication of a new congregation. And uh, there, were, there are two, two particular realities in those readings that I want to highlight uh, for us today. The first one is what we have already mentioned. It is God who does the building. It is God who does the saving. It is God who does the choosing and the appointing and the sending. We see that so clearly in the, in the Gospel text today in John 15 where Jesus is telling these apostles there in the upper room as he's 
uh, with them at a, at a major transition point in what's about to happen. Because soon he will go to the cross and rise again and ascend to heaven and turn all of this over to them and to those that they will disciple as followers of Christ. And he tells them, I call you my friends. The former denomination that I was part of for 30 years loved that verse. It was called the Evangelical Friends Church, Eastern Region. They loved it when they said Jesus called us friends. But he says, I'm calling you my friends, and and for several reasons, I'm making known to you. I'm making known to you. I'm revealing to you what my Father's will is. And this is his will, that you will go and you will bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And he reminds them that it is Jesus who chose them. It's Jesus who saves them. It's Jesus who appoints them and sends them. And that's true for all of us who are gathered here today. And the second reality is that once he has chosen us, saved us, chosen us, called us, appointed us, he gives us a work that is done and it's to be done by all the people of God. It's, It's to be done by all the people of God. Not just a select few, certain ones, but for the ministry of all of the saints. And you find it in in all of the the three other passages very, very clearly. The Numbers passage. Again, when Israel is in a major transition, and and this comes up and it's in my mind today because this is a a key transition point for St. Anselm's. This full parish status and the functioning in, in all of the regards that that brings. And so... In Numbers, the the people of God have been led out of hundreds of years of slavery. And they're being brought through the wilderness and about to be taken into the promised land. And in the midst of all of that upheaval, as they're, they're trying to learn how to live like a free people of God, when all they've known is slavery and oppression, and God begins to reshape and rebuild them with the words of His covenant and with a way of worship. And in the midst of it, uh, the people are grumbling. There was, a, there was a little bit of a glitch today when I, when I had uh, Ken and Andrea send along the readings, and it originally said Numbers 11, which was like the whole passage. And it starts out with a whole bunch of verses about how much the people of God grumble and complain. That's not a good text for today's message. Uh, it may be true from time to time, but it's not a good text for today's message. But it's, it's, out of, it's out of that turmoil and that sense of unsettledness and unease with all the people of God that Moses is finding this, this task is too big for him. And he's asking the Lord for help. He, he's literally praying one of two things. God, help me or kill me. Get me out of here. Uh, it's too big for me. And so in the midst of it, the Lord gives him wisdom and and says that he should ask for others who can come alongside and labor with him. And he commands him to to select 70 elders from among the congregation. And as he does that and they present themselves before the Lord, God says very clearly, Moses, I want to take the same spirit that's on you and put that spirit on all of these men who will labor with you so that you'll know that it's not yours alone, but that it takes all the people of God working together. And when Moses sees that happen, when he sees how dynamic that reality is, his prayer is this, Oh, that God would pour this same Spirit on all of His people, that all had this this Spirit of the living God to be prophetic. Do you realize that God answered that prayer? God answered that prayer of Moses on the day of Pentecost when he poured out his spirit and Joel prophesied and said the day was coming when he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. That your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men, this is my favorite piece of that, your old men will dream dreams. And then there's some young men in here who see visions. Old, young, men, women, all with the spirit of God upon them to labor together with God for the work of the kingdom. We live in the age when God answered that prayer. Thanks be to God. The Psalm 132 passage is in another transition time for the people of God. They they have now come into the promised land. This psalm is actually 
a, a song of ascent that they sing as they go up to Jerusalem for the great feasts. But the context of it points back to that time when they've come into the land and, and now the presence of God will be celebrated not in a moving tabernacle, but because of David's heart, God allows him to make provision for his son Solomon to build a temple. And throughout that process, David was yearning that the Ark of the Covenant would be brought back that had been lost in battle because it represented the very presence of the living God among them. And this psalm celebrates how David carried such passion for this, for the presence of God, that he said, I, I won't even sleep or slumber until the ark of God, the presence of God, will arise and come to his resting place. And so in the midst of that, as that song is being sung years later in a celebration of pilgrims going up to Jerusalem, verse 9 says, Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and your saints sing for joy. All the people of God. All the people of God. With the Spirit of God upon them. Celebrating and working together for the sake of His kingdom. And we're reminded of it every day in the daily suffrages of morning and evening prayer. The passage in Ephesians, where I'm going to settle for just a moment, speaks very, very clearly about this. Especially verses 11 and 12 where God has given apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, offices of leadership in the life of the church, not to do the work of the ministry, but to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Again, all the people of God. In this one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we believe in one apostolic ministry, in four orders, Bishops, priests, deacons, and laity, the priesthood of all believers. This great reality that was recovered for us in the Reformation. We had a, this session yesterday as I was telling you about uh, sharing with some folks preparing to be ordained uh, to the diaconate, some as transitional deacons to go on to the, the, the ministry of a presbyter, and who knows, by the will of God, perhaps someday as a bishop, but the point that I was making to them is this. There are not three or four different ministries. There's not the bishop's ministry. There's not the priest's ministry and then the deacon's ministry. There are different functions that we serve, but there's only one ministry. There's only one apostolic ministry, and we all function, laity, deacons, priests, and bishops together, serving Christ and serving one another that the work of His kingdom gets accomplished and His body gets built up. And so what I love about this service of instituting a rector is it, it states so clearly that, that this is our ministry. This is ours together, serving Christ at St. Anselm. Well, the, the passage in Ephesians that was read has a fascinating context. Anybody who's ever been around me for more than five minutes know that I always talk about the context. Context is everything. This letter to the Ephesian Christians is one that Paul is writing as a more mature apostle to a more mature congregation. He's writing to a group of people in Ephesus who came from very different cultural backgrounds. Jews who had come to faith in Jesus as their Messiah and Gentiles who had come in to know Him as Savior and Lord as well. And so he has to communicate with them about them being reminded that the, the dividing walls have been torn down and there's now one new man in Christ. There's no us and them. There's no we and they. And as he, as he unpacks that for them, he comes to the beginning of chapter 4 and he says, Therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. There's not a body for Jewish Christians and a body for Gentile Christians. There's not a Holy Spirit for Jewish Christians and a Holy Spirit for Gentile Christians. 
male, female, slave, free. There's one body, one spirit. We were called to one hope that belongs to all of us, a call of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so, in this united body of Christ, His Spirit being poured out upon all of them, He says, this is what's going to happen. And this is what we're celebrating today. This is what is happening in our midst. This is what we're experiencing. That when we all are working together, empowered by the Spirit of God, things begin to emerge that are signs of the kingdom. God empowers, graces His people to maintain and build His work by the power of the Holy Spirit. You notice that it's unity of the Spirit that we are to labor to maintain. It's God Himself who makes us one. And then we commit ourselves to everything possible to yield and obey to maintain that beautiful spirit of unity given by God Himself. And we can't do that on our own. We can't do that on our own. Without the Spirit of God filling us, using us, sanctifying us, we're just too prone to slip into our own individual selfish wants and desires. And so, this whole passage leads somewhere later at the end of chapter 5 when he says that we're to be people of understanding who keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how we maintain this God-given unity that came from the Spirit. That we would walk this out in fullness. Friends, it is not by might nor by power. It's not by Father Sean's good looks alone. All the wisdom and intelligence of the vestry. All of the wonderful other attributes of the people around here. It is by the Spirit of the living God that this house is built. This unity is maintained. And the kingdom of God goes forth in powerful witness to the world. And when we rely on the Spirit that way, these characteristics of, of the, these marks of Christ's work among us begin to show up. And, and those come as he talks about how the, how the clergy, how the apostolic leadership builds into the saints and equips them for the work of the ministry. And he says when, when that happens, when we're when we're, so to speak, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we're, we're, we're firing on all cylinders. He says what happens is we come to the unity of the faith. We come to the knowledge of the Son of God and to the maturity of Christ. And that we come to the stability of an unshakable kingdom. I love that, that we sang how firm a foundation. We did sing that, didn't we? I didn't imagine that. You know, I, I, I might have gotten a little delirious because I was sitting in a heavy cope right next to the heater uh, right after lunch. So I might have dreamed a few things. But that these are the realities. So we come to the unity of the faith. Folks, human beings, because we're made in the image of God, created so wonderfully, we have the ability to do some amazing things. We just have to be careful that they're the things we're supposed to be doing. Human beings, sinful human beings, have proven time and time again the capacity to strongly unify around really bad ideas. See Genesis chapter 11 in the Tower of Babel. See other atrocities throughout human history. And so that's why Paul says we need to be people with discernment and understanding by the Holy Spirit so when we know the mind of Christ, then by His God-given grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we come together in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. What does it mean to know Jesus? Jesus said this is eternal life that you know God the Father and the One whom He sent, Jesus Christ. It means that we 
don't just know about Him, it means that we know Him. We've encountered the reality of who He is and His claims on our life. It's a word of deep intimacy and real knowledge, not just head knowledge. I lived for too many years with a head knowledge of who Jesus was until one day in a marked and assured moment of a conversion of faith, I came to realize that He was the Son of God who gave His life for me and for the world on the cross. That He bore my sins and they were many in His body on the tree. That He, the sinless Son of God, who had no death penalty to pay, took my place, took your place on the cross because all we like sheep had gone astray, wandered off to our own way. And in the mercy and grace of God, the sinless Lamb of God offers Himself once for all a sacrifice to pay the penalty for the sins that we had committed. Brothers and sisters, those others who are assembled, if you have never fully trusted Jesus Christ alone and His finished work on the cross and the empty tomb and the pouring out of His Spirit for your salvation, your health, your wholeness of life, do it today. I've discovered that there's a way... You know, The Scriptures say in Proverbs 14.12, there's a way that seems right to a man. There's a way that seems right to persons. Actually, there are a bunch of ways. We come up with all kind of ways that we think are going to help make us right. But the end thereof is the way of death. Not of works of righteousness that we have done, but by His saving grace and blood. By grace we're saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works before the world began. I appeal to you, by the mercies of God, if you have never abandoned hope in everything else which will lead you nowhere, and put your trust fully in Jesus Christ, the saving Son of God, who who is the way and the truth and the life for eternity, I encourage you, to surrender your life to Jesus today. That's what it means to come to maturity in the knowledge of God. And mature humanity, maturity in Christ-likeness, this, this body that builds itself up in love because the Spirit of God is at work in us, making us look more and more like Jesus Himself. That's what should manifest the further a church moves along. Those are the marks of the kingdom not folks who, who have so many different agendas and ideas about what happens next, but we come with the mind of Christ and we know His will and we pray with confidence and the Lord shows us this is the way, walk in it. And the stability. We come to that place where we're no longer children who are tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, but we're grounded and mature and stable because our faith has been built where Paul begins in Ephesians 2 on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ Himself, the cornerstone. This is what God is at work. This is what God has been doing. We wouldn't be here today. Is that true? Are we all just such brilliant people that we did this all by ourselves? <laughs> No, this is God's work. And we give Him glory. This is what God wants to continue to do. St. Anselm's, don't get sidetracked. You were, you were birthed as a mission. Now that you're a parish, birth other missions. Continue to preach the Gospel. Lead men and women to Christ. Do the work of His kingdom together and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, I'm going to attempt to land this now. Pray. People know that it takes me a while to get the plane safely on the tarmac. 
as, as Paul has shared this admonition and given this beautiful picture of what happens in this congregation by the grace of God and by the power of the unity of the Holy Spirit, he comes to the middle of chapter 5 and he reminds them where they came from and he tells them who they are now. And he says in verse 8, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now you are light in the Lord. I love that this is happening during the season of Epiphany. I think I've just recently discovered that Epiphany is my favorite season. I never thought about this. I was just talking with my wife Terry about this. I actually came to that marked and assured moment of conversion to the Lordship of Christ, and now when I look back, I realize it was during the season of Epiphany. One of the first passages of Scripture I ever memorized as a young believer was Malachi 1, 10, and 11. Nobody tells you to do that. That's not the first passage of Scripture they tell you to, to memorize. But I started reading through the Scriptures, places I'd never read before, even though I was raised in the church. And I read that in, in Malachi 1.10... The Lord was talking to the people of God because they weren't offering their best to God. And it spoke to me because for years as one raised in the church but doing everything I could to live in the world, I was constantly living in this mishmash of religious activity and absolute pagan behavior. And as I came, these words struck my heart. The Lord was so serious about right worship that He said, Oh, that someone would shut the doors rather than profane altar, profane fire be kindled on my altar. And I thought, like the, like the words in the Rich Mullen songs, God ain't just putting on the Ritz. He's really serious about this. He's really serious about His claims that every part of my life must be His and His alone. And then it goes on to read that opening sentence of Scripture we've read in daily prayer all throughout this season. For from the rising of the sun until the setting of the same, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, a pure offering will be offered, for my name will be great among the nations, declares the Lord of hosts. Once you were darkness, now you are light. In the Lord. This is the admonition for St. Anselm's today and for all of us. We are light in the Lord. Let the light shine. Let this light shine brighter and stronger into the day of the coming of Christ. This is what it means in Matthew 5 when he tells us. Where, where a city of light set on a hill shine. You've been set on a hill for people to see the light of Christ. You're a lamp not to be hidden under a basket, but on a stand for everybody to see. And let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Throughout this season of Epiphany, we've been praying for this. This has been our prayer life together. Now, I've, I've got something that I saw in my mind's eye for the conclusion of this, and it, just, it was amazing. It was amazingly beautiful. I don't know if we can pull it off in reality or not, but I'm going to try. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Are you with me? Everybody's like, I don't know, Bishop. Uh, you scare me sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so throughout this season of Epiphany, what have we been, been praying together? We've been, we started with the baptism of our Lord and recognized how all of us have been put into Christ through baptism. And then on the next Sunday, we gathered together and we prayed, Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. And then we gathered a week later and we prayed, 
Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of His salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of His marvelous works. And in intervening weeks, we prayed that God Himself would protect and guard and govern and guide and preserve us all unto this reality. And then we've come on this mission Sunday. And we have prayed that Almighty God, through the outpouring of His Holy Spirit, would cause Christ to be revealed as the way of eternal life to every race and nation. And we pray that God will pour out this gift anew. We're going to pray for that this morning. That God will pour out this gift anew. But as we prepare to pray it, I'm going to uh, bid you all to be the light of the Lord. Throughout this Epiphany season, one of our uh, supplemental canticles has become uh, very important to us and we've used it. It's from Isaiah chapter 60. And so I'm just going to try what I saw and we'll see what happens. And when I bid you with, with the words of Isaiah chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. When I bid you to do that, I want to ask you to stand with me. We're not going to all stand at once. We're going to do this in order. And each time I'm going to ask those who are standing to share in that bidding with me for those who are not standing. I hope that's not too crazy or confusing. We'll just give it a shot. Jesus would rather have us make a few mistakes than not try anything at all. Father Sean, I bid you, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. Assisting clergy, St. Anselms, I bid you, Father Sean with me, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. Fellow clergy from the ADGL, I bid you, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Vestry, lay catechists of St. Anselm's, I bid you, arise, shine, for the Lord has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you members of the, the St. Anselms who labor together. You work with children. You serve on committees. You might be in the, in the office. I bid you to stand and arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. All the people of St. Anselms, whether this is your second Sunday or you've been here for years, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. All of God's people, I bid you, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Is anybody left sitting? And here's our witness to the world. Lakewood, Northeast Ohio, across this region, in the name of Jesus Christ, we say, Arise, shine, for your Lord has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, You revealed the way of eternal life to every race and nation. Pour out this gift anew that by the preaching of the gospel your salvation may reach to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.